Hello everybody, just thought I'd give a quick disclaimer before this video starts that in this video at points there are discussions of things like uh, terminal illnesses and stuff like that so if you'd rather not engage with that kind of stuff I completely understand I'll put a timestamp on screen for where you can skip that kind of stuff also uh, on that note I've also included links to a couple of charities that you can donate to in the description of course there are others but I just put a few down there so any donation would be cool uh thank you welcome back to the Evan Witten our youtube channel the home of album reviews discography guides and think pieces there are many artists who have sadly passed on who have greatly influenced me in the music that i like and that i listen to and the way that i engage with music like david bowie lee scratch perry andy weatherall the ashton brothers of course keith flint maxi jazz marky e. smith the list goes on and on and on and on and on but I would argue that no one has ever really had as much of a profound impact on how I listen to music other than perhaps Keith Flint than the man I'm talking to you about today, which is a man called Hardy Fox. Now, Hardy was the primary composer for a band known as The Residents, one of my favourite bands of all time, arguably the best avant-garde music band of all time, at least of the past 50 years, and who have, you know, continued to churn out record after record after record that are brilliant, I'm sure, in their own ways, but because there are so many of them, I haven't really had chance to listen to that many of them. And I've been wanting to do a tribute video about Hardy for quite a while, but I wondered how I would do it, because there's such like a vast oeuvre of things to kind of cover. Like, what do you do? And I thought that what I would do is uh, zone in on a particular era of his career that I would argue is maybe even more artistically uh, significant than The Residents. Not only in its effect on me, but also just as a representation of everything that was great about him as an artist, which I know is quite a big statement to make. But the things that I'm going to be zoning in on are his uh, self-named solo albums that he released in the last year of his life. Because for those of you who don't know, The Residents are a band who, for a long time, were sworn to secrecy, never revealing their identities, never doing anything that would personify them in any way whatsoever. Uh, but then Hardy, towards the end of his career, after retiring, said, you know what, enough's enough. And in the last year of his life, he revealed in, I believe, one of his newsletters, or maybe it was a novel that he wrote on his website called The Stone, that he and the residence composer were, in fact, one and the same. And in the last few months of his life, began to release albums under his own name that were of a much more kind of personal, vulnerable nature, and that I think are absolutely fantastic and integral to not only Hardy as an artist, but also to my enjoyment of him and his stuff was like absolutely blown out of the water. Like I absolutely loved all the resident stuff that he was involved with and still do, but it's the personal stuff that he released for my money that is arguably the most significant. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over each of these releases and kind of give you a bit of a history lesson, bit of a review, bit of like a mix of things to show you just how truly great Hardy was as an artist, because believe me, it's fair to say he's got his stripes. So, you know, just a heads up, this video might be very rambly, but I thought that the best way to approach this really was to just get all of my ideas out there, just completely splat them out onto the table. And so you can do what you will with them, I suppose. But before we do any of that, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna give you a quick uh, history lesson on the formative years of Hardy's life, just to give you a portrait of the guy behind it all. And then we'll get into some of the more musical personal stuff. Hardy Fox, also known as HW or simply H, was born on March the 29th, 1945 in Longview, Texas to his father, Hardy Senior, and his mother, Lillian. His father was an oil pumper in the oil fields of the area, while his mother was a more freewheeling artistic type, and it became quite clear early on that she was the one he took after, as it became quite clear that Hardy wasn't exactly what you might have called normal back in those days, as he once recounted on his own website describing his nightmares to his mother by banging on the piano and talking in strange voices. His older sister, Linda, also expresses a similar sentiment. There's some aspects of HW, you that's a typical boy but then he's also kind of marching to the beat of his own drum he had a wind-up record player and some children's records and if nobody was looking he would sing and dance to those with his own movements 
but if somebody was looking, he wouldn't do it. Hardy continued to develop and showcase an artistic flair throughout his youth, whether it be by erecting a homemade backdrop for his high school talent show, or a particularly fondly remembered weekend with his cousin Dave Clark. HW came up with this idea. Let's write a play, and the record play will be the background music. He wrote out the entire script, and we rehearsed it with the Mantovani. After two days, we recorded it on that recorder. We listened back to it and thought, man, that sounds professional. I couldn't believe he was doing this at 14. Hardy later enrolled in Louisiana Tech College in 1963, and it was there he met lifelong friend and Louisiana native Homer Flynn, and despite only being put together by virtue of both being Methodist and having similar initials, the two quickly bonded over their love of music. He was an art major at an engineering school, really. We discovered we each possessed a different version of Ray Charles's What I'd Say. He and I took our dueling versions, put them on two turntables, lined them up and tried to make them play together. It upset someone in the dormitory and we were reported to the Dean. Hardy eventually graduated with a degree in commercial art in 1968 and that same year was set to be drafted into the US military, although was eventually rejected based on what his sister remembers to be a mild form of epilepsy developed at college. Except not everybody remembers it that way, as Homer Flynn remembers it was actually future Cryptic Corporation member John Kennedy who was afflicted with the seizures and that Hardy simply convinced himself he suffered the same ailment, albeit to less severity. He even went as far as to later claim that due to this form of epilepsy that he may or may not have had, that his orgasms had a strangely musical side effect, as Homer himself later contemplated. One of the remarkable things about Hardy, and this could be a good thing or a bad thing, he had an amazing ability to create his own reality and buy into it. From a creative point of view, this ability to create his own reality was very empowering, but it leaves you off on an island by yourself because no one can figure out what you're up to. However, it was soon after this failed drafting that Hardy, along with multiple friends including Roland Sheenan, began to sow the seeds of what would later become The Residents, arguably the greatest avant-garde band of all time and the rest, as they say, is history. So with all that out of the way, we move on to actually talking about some of the Residents releases for a brief time anyway, because I feel like they equally contextualize uh, what he would go on to do later, because not only do the Residents have great albums throughout their early years, like Meet the Residents, Third Reich and Roll being a personal favorite of mine, where they kind of mashed and collaged covers of a load of 60s pop songs. It was really brilliant. Obviously you've got Duck Stab, Eskimo, of course, brilliant the commercial album, you move into the 80s, you've got stuff like, um, you know, the American Composer series, the Mole Trilogy, the King and I, uh, you move into the 90s, you get stuff like Freak Show, CD-ROM projects like Bad Day on the Midway, you move into the more modern era, you get releases like Wormwood, Demons Dance Alone, Animal Lover and Tweedles are um, some of the more, uh, you know, later releases that have a good reputation. Granted, I haven't had a chance to really listen to those yet, but they are meant to be brilliant, as is their 2017 album, The Ghost of Hope, which, despite being released in 2017 and Hardy officially retiring from the group in 2015, contains some of his last musical contributions, and they'll be relevant in a minute, or at least probably like 10 minutes in the scheme of this video. But, point is, the residents have a long, vast oeuvre of brilliant music to go off of throughout their career, whether it's 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, consistently brilliant, always evolving, always changing, with Hardy as the musical heartbeat of the group, if you like, uh, for basically their entire runtime, or lifetime, I should say. Uh, and, but what happened in the 2010s, which was quite peculiar, was that the residents, for the first time, were given individual identities, and this started with their 2010 Talking Light show, where they were given the personas of Randy Rose for the lead singer, Lionel Bob for the guitarist, and for Hardy, the persona of Charles Bobuck, who was the resident's composer. And so to add to this kind of human element that the group were going with at this time, Hardy began to release a uh, number of solo albums or contraptions under the Charles Bobuck name, which were kind of you know, they were sort of builders like The Residents present Charles Bobuck rather than like Charles Bobuck albums on their own, probably to inflate sales figures while also trying to create kind of a differentiation between like mainline Residents releases. Although this actually wasn't the first time something like this had happened because actually under our noses for quite a while, Hardy had been making albums under The Residents banner that weren't particularly mainline Residents releases but, you know, we're kind of instrumental works or other kind of offshoots of things, whether it's EPs like High Horses, the whole Combo de Mechanico 
project that he did a couple of times. Turns out I actually meant to say Sonidos de la Noche, but I mean, cut me some slack. Like, there's a billion different pseudonyms going on here. Notably, Polex Christi, which was, uh, I believe, a reinterpretation of a fake Bavarian avant-garde composer's magnum opus. And yes, you heard me right there. And it's about as ridiculous and incredible as it sounds, where, like, you know, bits of classical music put through MIDI software is jammed in with, like, TV themes and stuff like that it's absolutely insane but the point was hardy was using these kind of extracurricular releases if you like to flex some of his other musical muscles and you know many of the charles bobuck releases were kind of the same whether it's stuff like uh, roman de la rose or the highway or my personal favorite which i actually have over here somewhere which is uh what was left of grandpa from 2015 a kind of jazz influenced album if you like which is completely nuts but brilliant and uh, a lot of this would actually be used as kind of the residence live walk-in music but it became clear as the kind of randy chuck and bob trilogy was wrapping up and uh, hardy fox had already retired from touring but continued to release uh, charles bobuck material into 2017 that he kind of realized like you know i'm not the residence anymore this isn't me like i'm putting on this fake persona this whole time that just feels like it's just not me and so you know he kind of discussed that dichotomy in the stone the book that i mentioned earlier in a very compelling abstractist way which i definitely recommend you read and i'll put a link to it in the description and so i feel like with that book he kind of shedded the charles bobuck persona and with it brought on the uh, self-named if you like the Hardy Fox era, the true solo era, which, as I said earlier, was the most distinctive and arguably artistically uh, kind of potent of the three. I'm not quite finding my words here, but the one release that started this all, and maybe for me, my favorite release of the three, would in fact be, if I can find it, this, Hardy Fox's self-titled Hardy Fox album, or Heart, released in February of 2018, I believe. Now, there are many things to me that make this album incredibly artistically significant. Uh, I'll start with the music, though, because as opposed to the Charles Bobuck stuff, which was, you know, lots of drum beats and guitars and strings and samples flying all over the place, Hardy Fox is a lot more minimal in its approach, just like electronic synthesizer pads, maybe the occasional very sparse drum beat, atmospheres flying in every so often, synthesizer sounds that are more subtle, the occasional arpeggiator going through, maybe the odd piano or two and flourish of guitar perhaps, but it is a lot, lot more minimal and pared down in its approach, which was apparently very deliberate because according to Walter Robotka, the uh, co-producer of the album, he wanted it to be more distinctive than Charles Bobuck stuff and so kind of, you know, Hardy would add bits on but then Walter would be like, no, that's too much, take that off. Or maybe add a little bit on here, you know. It was after Hardy had changed his performing name from Charles Bobuck to Hardy Fox. I said to him, you know, with a new name, we need a new style too. And uh, Hardy started doing something very electronic. I said, maybe you should strip it down a bit because, you know, it still sounds like Charles Bobuck stuff. So he stripped it down, but he stripped it down so much that I said, um, maybe you should add a bit more. And, uh, you know, this was the way that we worked together. I mean, it was just, it was just great fun. And I think that what he's come up with in the end, the, the songs on the Hardy Fox album, is the best thing he's ever done, you know, as a solo artist. I think it's absolutely amazing. And it's kind of, it felt like a collaborative effort, but one that definitely resulted in a more distinct sound because it is very electronic and at points, admittedly, very beautiful, but not without its strangeness. Like tracks like The Bather, as kind of, you know, electronic and otherworldly as they seem with their kind of melodies and their beats, have a kind of dark undertone to them, whether it be because of the guitars or the rather sour vocals, which I'll get onto in a minute. I'm Or perhaps it's the very graphic lyricism that goes throughout this album because this album is an album essentially exploring some of R Hardy's earlier sexual escapades in sometimes fairly graphic detail. Not like that graphic detail, but using imagery that can maybe like kind of make you squirm a little bit maybe. And to be fair, Hardy actually expands on this in quite an interesting way in the description for the album's exclusive website. Here's a new idea. How about writing a love song? Oh, you say it's been done, maybe overdone, 
So why would I be so foolish as to tackle such a subject so fraught with cliches and meaningless sentiment? Probably because I'm stupid, but also because I've been led around by love in some form my entire life. That isn't really a complaint. Seriously, there isn't much in the world that's as interesting as love in its many related variations. Attraction, obsession, sexual fantasies, broken hearts. It's the fuel that many of our lives run on. The question remains, why join the horde of people trying to say something new about love? I suppose that the emotional state is, more or less, unique to each person. Each of us has our own approach to dealing with and surviving the chemical and hormonally driven state of mind. For me, I'm still able to love as an older gentleman, but the intensity of love always takes me back to my youth when all was new and strange. Each element that drove my sexual exploits had to be explored, considered and digested. Now older, I'm able to gain some objectivity to set memories to music. This album is a glimpse into my younger self. Well, truthfully, probably not. It is likely yet another fantasy of an ageing man still led around by his dick. But I feel like that is the point because it's meant to be very personal, but it feels very hardy. I mean, it's not like disgusting, don't get me wrong, but there is definitely like a personalness and a rawness to some of the escapades described that are kind of, uh, you know, I don't know if graphic is the word, but it definitely helps to add to this album's sense of kind of oddity and again otherworldliness and the way that that's often put under slightly dark uh, and sort of twisted electronic backing as beautiful as some of them might be as i say uh, a prime example would maybe be uh, a track like leg where it's basically just this very sparse very kind of sad sounding almost slightly sinister electronic backing where hardy talks about falling in love with not someone but someone's leg and how weird that is there's also tracks like rather be you or christ that are very kind of lyrically inscrutable but very kind of musically dark and intriguing and kind of uh, very very odd and very very avant-garde and very very sparse and quite uncomfortable in a way but in a way that is still incredibly captivating although what i would say is that a lot of the music on this album is very very beautiful albeit with that dark tinge uh, tracks like a song about you the opener are just, I mean, it's so incredible. The way that it starts off with Hardy's very hushed vocals and then goes into these bursts of synthesizers, eventually cascading into this kind of dark atmosphere in the latter portion is just absolutely incredible. And some of the washes of atmosphere are just, they're completely otherworldly. There's no other way I can really describe them. Uh, tracks like The Bather, as I say, do also have that, but with the guitar adding to that kind of subtly dark sound. Light of Day would be another example where some of the atmospheres and the melodies are just absolutely heavenly and just completely like, it feels like music from another world. That's the only way I can really describe this album is that it feels genuinely otherworldly. Like I, I have no, like I'm really into like finding out how things make what sounds. I can't even imagine what his recording setup must have looked like to make these sounds, but I, it's Light of Day particularly is a really, really beautiful musical moment, but again, kind of offset by slightly graphic lyricism that does feel quite odd, but also, as I say, very captivating and also very human because Hardy, I think, was a, a very mysterious person. And so I think he might have um, quite, quite enjoyed kind of giving us details about his personal life while still maintaining that mysterious uh, kind of, you know, persona, if you like. It's some of the music towards the end of this album, though, that is arguably my favourite. The track South is very sparse with these kind of odd glockenspiel sounds cascading over these very saint faint synth stabs that sound really, really kind of calming, but are also undercut by these occasional washes of what sound like guitars or maybe subtle kind of passages of strings that have quite a sour sound to them. And Hardy's vocals do kind of lean into that at points as well. Uh, Talking to You is an incredible musical moment. The way that the piano meshes with the beat on here, particularly in the intro, sounds incredible. The way the vocoders are used are brilliant. And the very serene kind of... Uh, heavenly outro on this track is absolutely phenomenal. I love it to bits.
And Yogurt, I think, is another particularly beautiful musical moment because not only is the music on it fantastic with the arpeggiated kind of odd cascading uh, percussion parts or the subtle organs that go throughout the song or the string passages that cope the kind of chorus sections, if you like. It sounds, again, beautiful is the word that I keep coming back to. And Hardy's vocals sound very fragile here as well, talking about how the loss of somebody might cause grief but not to get caught up in that grief and to kind of remember them as they um as they were as you know remember them as a good person essentially which is an incredibly touching uh lyrical sentiment particularly given the general lyrical themes of this album and i think it's a brilliant note to end on but for my money the magnum opus of this album has to be the track broken hurt because this song i think epitomizes every single reason why i love this album because not only is the instrumentation fantastic it's very very sparse it's literally just the same repeating slightly shifting modulating morphing synth line going underneath the track but it sounds absolutely brilliant and the way hardy's vocals complement it is brilliant the shots of strings and organs at points and that and like very subtle bits of kind of dramatic orchestral percussion really make this it's an utterly cinematic experience i can describe the first time i heard this song like i you know i was sat and i you know i discovered hardy fox's solo stuff after getting back into the residence just after he passed away actually and i stumbled upon this album and this was uh, a, a track that i just kind of randomly clicked on maybe because it was the longest one and i was just blown away like the the emotion that Hardy puts through in his voice and the way the music kind of subtly blends and shifts around him, how melancholic it was, how dramatic it was. I genuinely shed tears the first time I heard this song. Gen genuine. And I, I still I, I still do a lot of the time when I hear this song. Like There's been a couple of times when I've heard this song and it's genuinely made me well up because you can, you can feel the humanness coming through in this album part of that is to do with hardy's vocals that i haven't really spoke about at length but are easily one of the album's most uh, defining characteristics because whereas with charles bobuck releases he would use various things like a pitch shifter or kind of various effects to make his voice sound not like him here his voice definitely does sound like him he still puts effects on it though which i think is the key thing because his voice definitely sounds like him and how many effects he puts on his voice on this album it doesn't take away from that it sounds unmistakably like him no matter how many vocoders or odd kind of electronic textures he might put onto it it still sounds very human and i think that was very cool how he's managed to put all these effects onto his vocals but still translate the fragility and the humanness of his vocals because you can still hear that he's not quite hitting those notes his voice is cracking a lot on this album almost with the emotion as if he is welling up while recording some of these and i think that that sounds incredible it might not sound brilliant to a lot of people but knowing that hardy wasn't a trained singer and kind of approached life with the general musical thing of like oh you know i don't really know how to do it very well but i just find my own way of doing it his performances and the way that he alters them on this album while still making them feel incredibly human is brilliant and i think broken hurt might well be his masterpiece. The next album that we're going to talk about is May 2018's Narked Zug, which is a 20 minute long mini album and is also the reason why I asked you to keep in mind the Ghost of Hope thing that I talked about earlier, where despite being released in 2017, Hardy retired in 2015. And the thing was that a lot of the music for that album, I presume, was written at some point in 2014. And this is backed up by the time that um, you can see, even on albums like What Was Left of Grandpa, that there are actually some very prominent musical elements from that album that ended up on The Ghost of Hope a couple of years later.
But the reason was that, like, Hardy was very, very dissatisfied with the way that studio albums were going for the residents because they hadn't released, like, a fully-fledged studio album since The Bunny Boy in 2008. And I think their transition to a touring band was quite jarring for Hardy because Hardy just liked to kind of chill out in the studio and make music and make albums. Whereas, you know, to be monetarily viable they had to keep touring which is why the album got held off for so long so he thought that for his second album release initially what he was going to do was just put some of the sketches for from the ghost of hope sessions onto an album although that was kind of very quickly discarded as not being ambitious enough and so instead hardy took some of that and reworked it into entirely new songs for Narkzog, and the reason for its runtime is explained in the Hacienda Bridge newsletter that um, covered it. When records were first invented, let's say the 78 RPM disc, each side held about 3-4 to four minutes of music, so that became the length of songs. Once the LP came along, it held about 17-22 to 22 minutes per side, that became the length of a non-stop recording. When I was young and first working, I played LPs by stacking three or four on a spindle which would drop each LP once a side had finished playing. I rarely listened to an album by turning the disc over and playing the two sides in sequence. I became quite influenced by the idea that a project was 17 to 22 minutes long. So then, what makes this different from Heart or his other releases? Well, I would say that this one, sonically, is a lot, lot darker because it's a lot more sparse well it's not actually no it's probably less sparse but it's a lot darker a lot more nocturnal a lot more industrial there's a lot more kind of sound effects and metallic textures and things like that which makes sense based on the concept of the album because similar to ghost of hope which talked about historical train crashes this one is also train themed specifically i believe about a train trip that he made to one of the last resident shows on the wonder of weird tour i believe in austria and that he had to take a night train to get there and so this is kind of a chronicle of his times and escapades and the people that he met on the night train and maybe this is just me but it's sort of like Hart in the same way where Hardy can make you feel he can transport you into another place and that's the thing like when I listen to this album I do feel like I'm sat on that train like I'm talking with these people that he's talking to in the songs and the very dark nocturnal vibe is obviously meant to not only reflect the train setting as you can hear many different sound effects and various kind of sound alike textures but also with the kind of night train vibe giving it a slightly more macabre maybe slightly more gothic kind of general vibe about it which i really really like because there's some super cool musical moments on this album there's the opening track someone sitting behind me which really nicely combines this old jazz brush style drum beat with these very industrial harsh electronics well they're not quite harsh but they're very much industrial metallic electronics being combined with this subtle jazz drum beat Or the track Paralyzed by the Lights, which uh, has some very nice military snares underpinned with some really nice washes of atmospheres and vocoders that sound absolutely incredible. And that is probably the one sonic bright spot on the album, although the drama that is in this song is brilliant as well, with kind of Hardy's spoken vocals like kind of going over top of this subtly building kind of almost orchestral style instrumentation underneath it which sounds incredible and also very kind of dark and subtly sinister as well at parts uh, there's the track sane too long with guitar contributions from nolan cook which is a very very repetitive kind of uh, dance style track with just the same lyric repeated over and over and over which might get boring to some people but to me i feel like actually works quite well to kind of maintain the monotony of the train journey which i think is what the, the song is about because it's saying i've been on this train too long i've been blah 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 and it kind of repeating and repeating and repeating kind of hammers that home and i feel like the just ever so subtle transition to the lyric being i've been on this train too long to i've been sane too long is actually quite a uh, quite a sort of weirdly cognitive dissonant kind of thing going on which is very very captivating uh, 
uh, the track Not Bored or Not Long, I can't remember, because all of the track titles you'll see on the back here are in German, and so I have to remember the vague English translations. But that is just a very, very short one minute interlude, which is very kind of, um, again, there are parts that are more musically dark, like the um, electronic kind of harsh keyboard progression halfway through it, but then also the kind of orchestral swell that the track ends on is incredibly uh, rewarding as well. But one thing that I would be remiss not to mention about this album is that it was actually supposed to be Hardy's last album because he was at the time about to undergo a heart surgery for a uh, an illness that he was suffering at the time that could have possibly killed him could be because if you look in the gatefold of the album or the digipack fold I don't know what the term is there is the image of a uh, a heart here which is meant to, I think, parallel the fact that he was going through surgery and this could have been his last album, which kind of makes sense of the kind of train imagery and the journey imagery throughout this album, kind of meant to parallel, I think, the journey through life. And there was a brilliant quote in the uh, Hacienda Bridge newsletter. It says, Nark Sug the Night Train understands beginnings. Nark Sug the Night Train comprehends ends. So I think that it was supposed to be a kind of symbolic representation of him coming to the end of his life, which makes the fact that the album ends on a slightly sort of sonically ambivalent note with the ending track almost kind of, you know, more compelling because, you know, it's not meant to be this big grand statement. It just kind of slowly and kind of subtly and slightly sinisterly kind of peters off. It's kind of uh, slightly off-putting when you view it into that context. I mean... Does the fact that he didn't, in fact, pass away after the release of this album take some of the sting away from it? Yes, I think so. But I feel like if you know the context behind this album and you know that, listening to it again, if before you didn't know that information, makes it a lot more of a rewarding listen conceptually while musically being stellar. Because while I haven't talked about the music as much at length as I did with Heart, and I probably won't do for some of the releases coming up, uh, I do think that the music is brilliant. Not only is it more industrial, more electronic maybe, with a few more organic elements into it, but just the general very dark nocturnal oeuvre that the album gives off is very, very cool. And it's also like deliberately unsettling at points as well. Like the track Three in the Morning, I believe, is just a very, very minimal electronic instrumental. Not a lot going on, but it kind of flies by with these very odd flashes of very, very compelling music in there that kind of, you know, it's it's like an album where it's constantly kind of trying to leave you on the wrong foot. It's constantly trying to kind of one-up you. It's constantly trying to kind of mess with you. And I feel like the album does a brilliant job of that because not only is the music brilliant, but I think that Hardy's spoken vocal performances have kind of a sternness to them and a kind of odd... They're not so much as emotive as they were on Heart, which makes sense, which makes them all the more compelling, I would argue. And even the ones that are more melodic are definitely a lot more fractured than they were on Heart. And so I think this album definitely has its nuances. If you're a fan of Heart, you might not be a fan of this, but I would absolutely urge you to check it out because, as I say, the more nocturnal, industrial uh, kind of sound palette of this album is brilliant, and I feel like the conceptualism and the lyrics and the performances create a really, really compelling listen, and uh, Paralyzed by the Lights would probably be my favourite track on this one. So, as I said, Nartzug was supposed to be the last album before Hardy's passing, although, of course, it wasn't, as that uh, status goes to the next album that we're going to be discussing, which is Rilla Contemplates Love from September of 2018. And this one is probably going to be the most difficult one out of the bunch for me to talk about, really, because it is formatted as one long, 45-minute long, nearly, track which makes it very difficult for me to talk about because it's not quite compartmentalised in the same way. But I will do my best because this, yet again, is another concept album for Hardy and kind of comes from the Sgt Pepper school of concept albums in that its concept revolves around something that never actually happened and doesn't exist. 
uh, which is basically the fact that it says on the back that they basically got a gorilla, put it on a bed of like some synthetic grass, hooked some machinery up to it, and then its movements were translated into music, and its thoughts, its brain waves, were somehow translated into words, and that this was the end result. Of course, that is all, all a load of horseshit, but nonetheless, a very captivating album concept, and one that I think is done brilliantly in execution, because this album, I feel like, is easily the most kind of sonically full of Hardy's solo ventures. Like, there's a lot of musical layers here. There's, like, tons of instruments flying in and out all over the place. I would say it's probably the most similar to the Charles Bobuck stuff that he did under that moniker, but it still has that distinctive kind of melodic flair of the personal Hardy Fox stuff that I'll get onto in a minute, because this album perfectly juggles the kind of avant-garde and the strange with the beautiful, and I feel like that is, in a way, the beauty of the album, is that you can go from these really odd, grainy, kind of sampled melodies and odd, off-putting drum beats and weird kind of, um, you know, industrial electronics or strange, otherworldly textures, like, and then transition straight from that into these really heavenly washes of pads and synthesizers and spoken word, and these really cool looping arpeggiators that sound incredible, back into complete auditory craziness, like weird uh, kind of filmic trap beats, or like there's a part on this album that sounds like an electro pop song gone through a blender, it's absolutely insane. The point is, Hardy can perfectly balance moments of chaos and dissonance with moments of beauty, and I feel like that is brilliantly done, because the more kind of, you know, sonically dissonant moments are definitely compelling. The intro would be a perfect example with these kind of odd, shrill vocal samples going underneath this very dramatic drum beat, or as I say, the kind of almost world music style trap instrumental around the 15 minute mark, or the electro pop mangling around the half hour mark. There's plenty of others that I could uh, pick from that are kind of very odd, very minimal. Again, otherworldly is the word that I would use. But there's also moments of absolute beauty, whether it be the various arpeggiators that come in and out at various points, the synth melodies that build and build and build in certain sections to points of genuine euphoria. I believe the uh, the spoken word portion may be around 13 minutes, or it might be 11 minutes, I can't quite remember. But that is a very intriguing moment. And I th let me tell you, listening to these albums on your own at night, which I have done, just sat by myself in a room, it really does transport you to a completely other place where you can go from these really dissonant sections to these really atmospheric sections. And it's like with Narcsog, your brain is being messed with in a very, very compelling way. And all the music on it is fantastic, of course, because Hardy is a brilliant composer. And I just want to know how some of these sounds are made because it sounds so not of this world and so like alien to everything else that music means that it is just brilliant. And I will say this as well, as far as the melodic side of it goes, the last three minutes or so on this album are, I think, genuinely some of the most beautiful music that Hardy ever composed, ever. Like, it might be very, very musically simplistic, but it sounds absolutely fantastic. The way the synths build up and cascade over the top, the way that the atmospheres work, the way that it kind of casts out on this subtly repeating arpeggiator and these blasts of synth chords, it sounds absolutely, it's brilliant. And it's yet again another moment where tears have been shed in the past when I've been listening to this. Because it is a journey, this album, this is the thing. It like it takes you to so many different sonic places, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Emotions are flying all over the place. One minute you're scared and confused, the next it's like serene and tranquil and beautiful. The next you've got no idea what's going on. The next minute it feels like your head's gone off your head and you're just running around like a headless chicken. You know, like it takes you to so many sonic places. And so for it to end on such an uplifting, brilliant heavenly moment like this is incredible and i feel like if 
they weren't to release any posthumous albums, I feel like as an ending to Hardy's solo career, you really couldn't get much better than this. And again, it's the thing like with Heart, where Hardy, throughout this whole album, puts a kind of effect on his voice which makes it sound very gruff, very deep, but also at the same time very artificial. So where you can tell that it's him saying it, but it's, I suppose, made to sound like the internal monologue of a gorilla, which is very compelling. But again, it's when those more emotional vocal moments come through where you can kind of see that veneer start to crack a little bit. And again, some of the lyrics on here are quite graphic, talking about, like, you know, condoms and penises and stuff, because a lot of the album, as with the title, Reela Contemplates Love, is about this gorilla kind of waxing lyrical on love, life, philosophy, relationships, earthliness, just the concept of life in general. And it's very, very compelling the way that it's put across, albeit in that very avant-garde way. So yeah, this album conceptually is brilliant, completely out there, completely nuts, completely hardy. The vocals absolutely play into the concept perfectly. The music takes you to so many different places at once. Some strange, some wonderful, some bemusing, some baffling, some downright beautiful. It's an amazing album, a brilliant experience, and one that will absolutely mangle your brain the first time you hear it. But I think also, by a similar token, is easily one of the most rewarding album listening experiences I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing in my entire life. And I don't say that lightly either. It's at this point, though, that unfortunately we're going to have to divulge some of the more tragic details of Hardy's life, many of which came to light during the promotion and release of this album, because either the day before or the day of release, Hardy updated his own personal website with the words Hardy Fox 1945 to 2018. But here's the thing, he hadn't died yet, so he put these dates up himself which scared the shit out of a lot of people at the time, to the point where the Cryptic Corporation, Hardy's old business partners and the residence PR team, had to say, like, look, he's not dead. Like, he's, like, you know, he's not, he's not passed away yet. But they did also say that it may be true. And Hardy seemed to kind of double down on this with a statement made on the more recent Hacienda Bridge newsletter promoting the album, in which he said the following. Hi from me, Hardy. Yes, God's sake making my pass out of this world, but it is all okay. I have something in my brain that will last to a brief end. I'm 73 as you might know, brains go down, but maybe here is my brain functioning as I'm almost a dead person. Just a bit of go yet. Doctors have put me on drugs, lol, for right now. Anyway, probably the last you'll be seeing of me. Thanks for checking in, love you all. Because the thing was, unfortunately, Hardy had been diagnosed with a very violent form of brain cancer known as glioblastoma and was given a very, very short prognosis. Of course, incredibly tragic. And I think that's what makes Rilla hit all the harder is because you, you look back on it knowing that this guy likely had very recently been diagnosed with this. And so the kind of personal tragedy of it really, really comes through on repeat listens, especially with prior contextual knowledge. And, you know, it's just, it was an incredibly tragic thing because, you know, you'd saw this guy who prior to this was like a, a just a fountain of creative knowledge and thinking and ideas kind of, you know, seemed to be very ill, his health on the wane. And perhaps one of the most uh, unsettling things to come out of this was a following Hacienda Bridge newsletter called Morning, where the contents were a very kind of odd disheveled looking photo of Hardy, along with the following words. I'm 73, dying of a head thing that will get me soon. So what? I had a dream that when I got up and looked in the mirror, my old father was looking at me from the rear. I didn't look at him, but asked why he was looking at me. He was sad and wished he could be part of my face. I suppose I am a rather happy guy my whole life. I sighed, said okay, but he could never, never participate in my sexuality ideas. So he joined me. I see him most mornings now and he's smiling at me. I kind of look forward to being a part of my father. And of course, this is put forward in the typically kind of abstractist Hardy Fox kind of way, primarily because none of that makes any sense. But it was like, it's such a, like, Hardy went out, I think, how 
he would have wanted to go out. Like the, you know, constantly, even even close to his death, kind of spewing out these ideas or these abstractist concepts or thoughts onto his website just while he could, you know, getting all of the ideas out there while he could. And as, of course, the Hacienda Bridge newsletter alluded to, he had sent some music from his vaults, so to speak, to Walter Robotka, the head of his label, Clan Gallery, to be released in due course. Although, unfortunately, it would only be a very short time before Hardy's passing as he passed away on October the 30th, 2018. But little did we know that Hardy had one last posthumous trick up his sleeve and it would prove to be undoubtedly one of the most terrifying, if not the most terrifying albums I think I've ever heard in my entire life. And that album is, ladies and gentlemen, the release only known as 25 minus minutes. But you might be asking, Evan, what exactly makes this album so terrifying? Well, with my light now turned on so I don't accidentally creep the shit out of myself while I explain it, I'll tell you. Because on his newly updated website, amongst other things written in his Rebecca Rothers alter ego, he wrote the following sentence. 2018. Hardy no longer records anything at all. That era ended. Perhaps even death wasn't the reason. He was thinking more and more he'd completed his personal expectations. Except the thing is, that wasn't strictly true. I mean, yes, before the Rilla announcement, he said that he'd uh, kind of handed over some stuff to Walter, presumably from the vaults. So I presume that this album would just be that. So what's so terrifying about that? Except it isn't. Because as far as I can work out, this project here that I am holding in my hand here was recorded in the last week of his life leading up to his death. And so with that knowledge in mind, I think is all the more terrifying. Because let's get the obvious out of the way first, which are the vocals and the lyrics. Because the lyrics are at points very, very blunt, talking about Hardy's illness and the way it affects him sometimes and his mental processes throughout the whole ordeal. Which, I mean, you might be thinking, oh, you know, it's kind of like the David Bowie Blackstar thing, you know, I mean, that was fairly stark, but you don't say, like, that album's terrifying. Well, no, I don't. Except the thing is, David Bowie put it in a very poetic, very kind of swan songish way. Whereas when you've literally got a man literally just talking at you about how he's got a brain illness, it's quite off-putting, especially given the very sparse, odd-sounding musical backdrop that he puts underneath it. It's not exactly, like, easy listening. I mean, granted, Black Star wasn't easily listening, but sometimes it's not even very melodic listening either. It's just straight creepy, some of it. Because the way he describes some of it at parts in this album is genuinely, like, really... Like, it takes you aback with how just, like, forthright it is. Like, some of the language used on this album is, like, so blunt and forthright that I was almost kind of taken aback by it. Like, if you look at some of the lyrics that I'm putting on screen here that someone helpfully transcribed underneath a YouTube upload of it, I mean, this is, like, really dark stuff i mean to the point where i mean i don't know whether it's just a psychological thing with me personally but when you've already got such a dark subject matter like simple turns of phrase are made all the creepier like just the phrase it's a little strange in the context of that big monologue where he's talking about like the nature of his illness that phrase alone coming from his mouth sent shivers down my spine like it, it's abs it's like the weirdest most uncanny, most tragic style of fear that, like, it's, it's so odd to explain and I can't really do it properly, but there are parts in this album that are just, like, really stark and really blunt to the point where it's genuinely scary. And the same goes for the vocals because the, the vocals, as in typical Hardy releases, do have a lot of effects put on them, do have a kind of strained you know, not the best singer quality, not the best breath control, whatever, about them. But it's it's made all the worse by the fact that you can hear how fragile his voice is due to his illness, and no amount of effects can possibly hide that from you. So there are parts where you can hear his voice genuinely, like, cracking and warbling while he's either monologuing or half-singing or whatever, and it's just so, so off-putting. Like, you can envision the kind of, you know, thing that was going on while he was recording this, and it just makes it so... Well, I say it's unpleasant. It's unpleasant in the way that it is, like, just very difficult to think about and difficult to 
face really but it's like i wouldn't say it's an unenjoyable album though although that's one thing that i'll get onto a bit later but so like you know you can hear the fragility in his voice despite all the effects that are put on it and um as well as that though some of the vocals sound like they're coming through like an answer phone or something like they're so tinny and warbly that like it, it feels like genuine i use the phrase otherworldly a lot in this video but this is like genuinely uncanny like the way that he records his vocals it's very very lo-fi very very kind of you know off the cuff diy to the point where i'm pretty sure you can even hear some of the mouse clicks to like stop his microphone program but all of that to me for whatever reason maybe it's just me all of that from the lo-fi recording to the vocals to the very kind of cheap sounding effects that don't mask his vocal fragility at all all of that makes it infinitely more terrifying but the lyrics that are even scarier for me and that kind of play more into the album's general sense of fear are the ones that don't even make any kind of semantic sense like there are some things on this album that just don't even make sense on a base level let alone in terms of the context of the project like a lot of them are either very blunt as i've said already or kind of detailing general escapades of kind of hardy's youth and his life or his general thoughts around what was going on at the time but some of them just do not make any sense whatsoever i mean the first hint we get of this is around the eight minute mark where he says um, i'm not playing this greeting i don't know what's pretty maybe it's all a load of rotten flesh what does that mean and also you get other things particularly later on into the project that are just straight up weird like he goes on this whole monologue about like we all like ugly but we wish it would go away maybe i can push a button and make it go away i'll put it all on screen and i remember like listening to this and reading the lyrics along with it and going just like what in the hell does this mean what does it mean it's because it makes no logical sense whatsoever why i find it so terrifying because then i end up going down a kind of logical rabbit hole where i imagine as though there must be some kind of deeper meaning to it somewhere and i just can't find it and so it just kind of constantly sits in this uncanny valley zone of not making any sense whatsoever but it's in context of stuff that does make sense and is relevant to the like concept of the album and so you just end up going how does this fit into anything how does this like play into anything what are the themes it doesn't make sense and you get a lot of these towards the end of the album particularly with as i say the kind of answer phone sections which if anything are the most creepy of them all because they happen i think around at first the 17 minute mark maybe and i think it says something like i'm not sure what you're trying to do that didn't really work too well and then perhaps the most spine chilling one at all maybe this is just my sense of fear again but that just like the silence and then he just goes you're not answering me and that genuinely sent like genuine full shivers down my spine and he's like i can plug this in i don't think we've heard this in a long time maybe you should sleep and then a piece of music plays for two minutes and then it fades back in with him going i keep forgetting to measure over and over and then he goes me and two of my partners from sweden have purchased hardy fox we now own all of the rights to his music for the future and that is the last vocal thing you hear on this album and you might be thinking evan that's not too bad well here's the thing me and two of my associates from sweden what does sweden have to do with it i thought maybe it was some like weird euthanasia reference but that would be switzerland it's not to do with his label because clan galleries in austria and they don't even say we purchased the rights to hardy fox's music they say you purchase the right to hardy fox maybe a linguistic slip of the tongue i don't know but anything that is possibly uttered throughout this whole album i for some reason think has to have meaning somewhere and so the stuff that doesn't drives me insane and this is the thing i was initially going to make a whole video just trying to decode what this album meant and initially the thing that i came to was that the the reason it kind of becomes more frenzied and kind of disconnected throughout the album is like the metaphor for the the illness taking over his brain which is a very dark and kind of you know very morbid kind of concept but it's like the only thing that i could possibly think of that would make this make any sense and the thing is as well 
the music plays into this. Because the music, it's not so melodic like Rilla or Heart. It's not so industrial like Narzug. It's kind of this weird budget MIDI kind of sound palette that it goes with for a lot of the album with some quite weird otherworldly textures. Like particularly the last, uh, the first minute or so, it's just these random metallic clanging sounds uh, with some vocals over the top of it. The second one is this very bit crushed kind of dramatic sounding passage that then goes into a very stark piano passage which then goes into a breakbeat passage then going into a metallic passage then fading out and going into an organ passage and it's just like it's so it's so weird none of the music connects with each other really in any meaningful way either because the music sounds very stark like it's very uh, kind of metallic very synthetic very otherworldly not very bright it's it just feels very dull very um but not dull in a bad way that i i genuinely can't describe it i'm like lost for words how would i describe it it does sound very midi very computerized very artificial and so i think the mix of that with the very human vocals is maybe what puts me off there are odd flashes of beauty though just odd flashes that are really compelling like the organ uh, section around eight minutes around let's say the first half of the album that is actually quite a beautiful moment just for 20 seconds or so but it is there and the um, piano passage on the first of the two last instrumental tracks I think that melody is quite compelling as well. But those are just fleeting moments in 25 minutes of complete strangeness and chaos and fear. And the structuring of the project makes it even weird because it not, none of the music connects with each other in any meaningful way. It'll literally just be like a piece of music plays for a minute, hard cut to the next one. A piece of music plays for two minutes, fade into the next one, hard cut into that one. And there's even points where like a piece of music will be playing cut to dead silence for like a straight five seconds and then randomly cut something else back in again that's completely unrelated to what just came before it then fade into something else this whole thing can be defined by a complete and utter sense of uncanny none of the music connects to each other it's all very strange and artificial sounding the vocals are very fragile but with a ton of effects on them that makes them not sound human and the lyrics are either very blunt or very kind of tragic in the way that they describe Hardy's condition at the time, or just don't make any sense at all and drive me insane. And it's this whole thing that contributes to a very, very odd sense of fear. Although, I will say this, for all of the ranting I do about this album and how much it scares me, to the point where, in the last two years, I've only brought myself to listen to it in full three times, I do think it speaks to the thing that I said earlier, where I think Hardy kind of, uh, you know, left his stamp on the musical world the same way he did on the kind of mortal plane, if you will. Like, his last messages to the world before he passed away were very odd, very abstract, very kind of seemingly devoid of any kind of meaningful depth. And this is much the same. Is it maybe the best demonstration of Hardy's musical capabilities? No, but that's understandable. But I feel like as a kind of encapsulation of Hardy Fox as a creative figure and his general kind of creative vibe, that this is basically encapsulated in this project, albeit in a very dark and morbid form, but that be it all the same. And also, I've just got to say this, there are, there are even things in the cover art that don't make sense. Like, this is apparently Hacienda Bridge, which is the name of his newsletter. What reference does that have to anything? I don't know. On the back here, there's a random picture of a cat superimposed onto it. What does that mean? No idea. Add to that that the image on the actual CD seems to be a picture of his actual fucking brain scan, and that's a whole other level of terrifying. But then again, that's just Hardy being Hardy, man, and to be fair, I don't think I'd want it any other way, because as I say, this is probably about as quintessentially Hardy Fox as you could possibly get. And I'm actually very lucky to own this, because this was, uh, as I believe, a limited release of 300. So I'm actually very uh, lucky to own this physical copy. And uh, to be fair, as much as it might freak the shit out of me, I am glad I own it.
So those are really all the four main Hardy Fox releases that I wanted to cover in this video. Of course there have been others since uh, 25 minus minutes, mostly instrumental compilations kind of taken from the vaults if you like. I don't think there is any more vocal material, I think the stuff that was on 25 was the last, although the instrumental compilation uh, Killing Time that was released wrong way around in um, April of 2020, I do think has some very compelling music on it, which um, again, kind of speaks to Hardy's general vibe, because it's some of it, it could be the simplest thing, because a lot of it is very kind of simple repeating motifs with stuff added, but it does sound very, very Hardy. And even the like 30 second intro instrumental that plays on this album has a kind of sense of whimsy and wonder to it that is really, really captivating, I think. Of course there are darker instrumentals on that album, there are lighter ones, and there are even some portions of 25 minus minutes that get played as instrumental tracks, which I suppose it's nice to hear them in a kind of isolated form, away from like the chaos and the absolute, complete, terrifying, uncanny nature of it all. So there is definitely stuff to be gained from that, as there is from the uh, recent release of the Iber soundtrack album, which I believe is meant to be soundtrack music to the Stone novella, which uh, initially revealed Hardy Fox's identity. So there have been other releases since, some of which actually has some pretty decent music on it. But for me, it's those four albums that truly encapsulate Hardy's creative spirit. And in honesty, that's what this video was always about. It's about saying, yes, Hardy was brilliant with The Residents and Charles Bobuk and stuff like that, but he was also incredible with his four mainline solo releases that he put out after that. And I think, I hope if this video has proved anything, it is that, that like even in the last months of his life, Hardy put together some of the most essential music of his entire discography and stuff that was very, very personal to him, but equally spoke to his strengths as a songwriter a million times over, was so human, so emotional, so brilliant, so stark, so like avant-garde and so experimental and all fantastic. So if there's anything that can really be taken away from this video, in essence, go listen to Hardy Fox, go buy his CDs, go listen to them on YouTube, do whatever with them, but please go listen to them because I think it's a real, real shame that even Residence fans don't know who Hardy is. And even in the grand scheme of experimental music, basically no one knows who he is. Whereas I think he is up there with the Zappers, with the Beef Hearts, with your great experimental composers. He is absolutely up there for me because Hardy was very important to me, not only in the fact that he made brilliant, compelling, I'm not exaggerating, life-changing, life-altering music for me, but also he fundamentally changed my perspective when it came to just not only music, but creativity in general. He kind of opened my eyes to a whole new world of sonic and visual and conceptual possibilities and is maybe, as I say, besides Keith Flint, the most influential creative I have ever come across in my entire life. And I think that f sense of just doing things completely how you want to do them, free from restrictions, free from expectations, just doing things completely on your own terms and not giving a shit how anyone else perceives it or what people think about it, that is just completely, it revolutionised things for me. And the idea that he wasn't even the most talented singer or even the most talented composer, but he found a way to do things that were specific to him. He didn't have to be Pavarotti, he didn't have to be Elvis Presley, he didn't have to be Liberace. He was just Hardy and that was fine, you know? I mean, and that's the ethic, really. And I think, if anything, he probably put it best himself. If you can't draw a good horse, well, then, you know, you don't do horses. You cut out pictures and you glue them down <laughs> next to each other and you make something cool, because that's all that matters, is that it, that it turn out cool. Spoken like a true outsider. Cheers for everything, Hardy.